Yeah, it's four minutes after or three minutes after. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. The New York State Caregiving and Respite Coalition welcomes you to our second webinar in the series of professionals that work with caregivers. I've had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Bamba on many occasions throughout the years, and I welcome her and her colleague, Katie Oram, to this forum. On a personal note, I will tell you that Dr. Bamba was a strong influence on me when it came to advanced care uh, planning for my mom. I turned to her uh, at a time when my efforts to use MOLST for my mother were shunned by a local physician. I reached out and sought her advice and I was then able to advocate more effectively for proper end of life planning. The most form turned out to be an incredibly powerful tool in advocating for my mother's final wishes. After my mother died, Dr. Bamba and I, I had the opportunity to share breakfast together. I can tell you that she is an incredibly kind, caring and responsive person. And I am deeply honored to share her with you today. Dr. Bamba says that she's inspired uh, by her mother's conversations about her own final wishes and personal stories from her patients and the community. Dr. Bamba is a driving force in the development of the MOLST initiative, which has grown exponentially under her direction. Since taking on her role as Vice President of Medical Director of Geriatrics at Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield, she has impacted us locally and is nationally known for her work. Dr. Bamba is joined today by Katie Oram, who is the Geriatrics and Palliative Care Program Manager at Excellus and the eMOLST Administrator for New York State. She's worked on New York's MOLST program for more than 10 years. She supports Dr. Bamba in the expansion and evaluation of advanced care planning, palliative care, and end-of-life care initiatives internally and across um, New York State and nationally. She's assisted many organizations in improving their advanced care planning and MOLST processes. So Ms. Orm is a member of the New York State MOLST uh, team executive committee. So we've invited Dr. Bamba and Ms. Orm to discuss this important initiative with you as professionals, to give you resources and to assist you in helping to facilitate the advanced care planning discussion with caregivers and caregivers, care receivers that you serve. And so with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Doris, I wanna thank you so much for that kind introduction. I do wanna in, uh, introduce the third member of our uh, key team, and that's Meg Greco. Um, and Meg uh, works as not only our coordinator uh, for our team, but she's the emails coordinator. And she also uh, basically manages the echo most and uh, echo emails program that starts tomorrow okay and i'll mention that later and also want to introduce a fellow um medical director uh, dr greg carnivali who's working with our team um as of yesterday and so uh welcome uh, dr carnivali and i want to thank both um meg and katie Kate, meg will be on in case there are any technical uh, issues which we don't expect because we've been zooming a for so long, but thanks for staying with us, Nick. Yep, I'm going to jump in really quickly. I know some folks already heard this, but we are offering um, CEU uh, credits for this presentation today. Order to receive credit or just for accurate attendance, attendance purposes. If you have access to the chat, if you could go ahead and put your name and more importantly, email address into the chat. If you don't have access to the chat, um, we're going to go ahead and email Doris in order to receive that CEU credit. And we're also going to be running Q&A through the chat as well. Thanks so much, Meg. And I, I appreciate that kind introduction again. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to do the first part of this uh, presentation, turn it over to Katie, who's going to talk about eMOLST and answer any questions about eMOLST. And she has a training to do it too. And I'm going to finish up talking about some resources. I think the most important question that each of us needs to personally ask is, will we die in a manner that's consistent in the way that we lived? Will it respect our personal values, our spiritual beliefs, our cultural background, and preserve our dignity? And I put this in there to remind each of us that as we're working with clients and families and caregivers, we need to do our own personal advanced care planning first. So I ask each of you to think, have I had a conversation recently 
with my family? Have I put it in writing? Do I have the skills from that kind of conversation, which can be difficult to be able to help the caregivers that are trusted to my care? And so let's think through what is the ideal um, conversation on advanced care planning. And it essentially is a conversation that occurs with the person, ideally their healthcare agent and alternative available and their primary clinician. And that is the person they trust, whether it's their doctor, their physician, their nurse practitioner, their PA, but other members of their uh, clinical team as well. It is done on a regular basis. It's recorded, it's updated as needed, and it really allows for flexible decision-making. It's not really about interventions. It's about talking about values, beliefs, and what matters most, um, and understanding that in terms of the current health situation. I'm gonna talk about two programs today, focusing most on most, but it's important to understand the differences between advanced directives and medical orders, the two different types of documents that are created as part of the advanced care planning process. And there are two programs that we created as part of the community initiative in Rochester two decades ago. One is called Community Conversations on Compassionate Care that really aims to make sure that everyone 18 and older uh, is completing a healthcare proxy and having a discussion. And that's for everyone across the population, as I said. And medical orders are for only for those with advanced illness or frailty. It's not for everyone. And it's not an advanced directive on steroids. 40 years when I started practice, medical decision-making was all about paternalism. Doctors made decisions. And then we shifted uh, with Patient Self-Determination Act to think about autonomy and ask patients what they want. But it, medicine is so complex and medical decision-making is so complex, it really is about shared decision-making. And we'll talk about that today in terms of most. So advanced care planning is a key pillar of palliative care. It's important to understand that and to be able to communicate that because oftentimes patients, families, caregivers do not understand the differences between palliative care and hospice. Palliative care is team-based care, and it basically means all of us work together with two goals, improve quality of life for the person with advanced illness or any chronic illness, as well as to make sure that we reduce suffering. Ideally, palliative care starts from the time of diagnosis, but the time when people need more palliative care is illustrated on this slide as they move from the time of diagnosis to their last year of life. And that's seen with this hatched line. The solid line means basically they're near six months in their last six months of life. This is called the surprise question. We'll get back to that. Would it surprise you if this person dies in the next 12 months? The next six months. And you'll see, if you just look at basic math under the area under the curve, people need to have more of the three key pillars of palliative care, which are advanced care planning, including making sure there's an up-to-date healthcare proxy and an, an accurate medical order for life-sustaining treatment, that is supported by a care plan that includes pain and symptom management and caregiver education and support. You'll see during this period of time that chronic disease management continues. It's just that it's gonna be less effective than it had been at the time of diagnosis. And there's a lot more time that needs to be devoted to these three key pillars. And over that period of time, the patient's goals for their care can shift. Just briefly about Community Conversations on Compassionate Care it is a program that focuses on who will speak for you, how, who will make the decisions. And while across the country, completion rate of healthcare proxies are still low, in our region, in upstate New York, in particular, we know from data from 2008 that it increased from a baseline of about 20% to 40%. There are five easy steps and storytelling that are the essence of this program. First, on understanding about advanced directives, identifying and removing barriers, motivating yourself through storytelling. And I appreciate Doris's story at the beginning because that's really what I think you're gonna remember at the end of today. 
and also then completing it. Completing it means having the conversation, picking the right person to be your healthcare agent, talking about values, belief, what matters most to you, understanding life-sustaining treatment, putting it in writing, and sharing copies with your key family members, your, and in particular, your healthcare agent and your alternate, and reviewing and updating. This is based on behavioral readiness, very similar to smoking cessation, going through Prochaska's five steps. Um, you, you quit smoking, you learn about it by removing barriers, you get yourself motivated, you do it, but sometimes you start smoking again, and so you need to start the process over again. That's really the basis of this program. I'm going to try to, to share a very brief story. Conversations change lives. Bill and Debbie know. My mother prepared for everything, including her own medical care. She said talking about dying didn't mean that she would die today. So she told us what was important to her, shared her wishes, and put it in writing. We were able to make sure that she died a peaceful, natural death, just as she wanted. Start your conversation. Visit CompassionAndSupport.org. So this very short PSA illustrates the value of the advanced care planning conversation, as well as completing documents for that family. And this next story illustrates what happens when there is no conversation. Conversations change lives. Joanne knows. My uncle thought he had all the time in the world, so he never talked to his family about his medical care. As he lay dying in the hospital, we didn't know what to do. He suffered on life support machines for three months. His wife struggled with this for years. If you love your family, complete your health care proxy. Start your conversation. Visit CompassionAndSupport.org. So as you're working with individual caregivers, it's important to share stories. If you're not sure how to do it, there are plenty of videos, and I'm going to review that uh, after our discussion on emulsed. The key elements are picking the right person and talking about what matters most and recognizing it's not just about death and dying. Advanced care planning also prepares individuals when they lose the ability to make decisions, have the ability to recover, and it's so important to know what matters most to help guide that decision making. And we've seen this over and over with over the past two decades as we've worked um, in our communities and especially during COVID when we know that people may seem to be on the brink of death and yet they're able to recover. And really someone needs to be able to make those decisions and that's really the healthcare agent. And it's for everyone 18 and older. And again, incapacity can affect all of us. So who's appropriate for MOLST? So advanced directives are one sort of document for the entire population, but MOLST is for a small subset where it wouldn't surprise the physician, the nurse practitioner, the PA, if that person might die in the next year. Sometimes it wouldn't surprise the person if they might die in the next year, but they, and they wanna talk about it and no one's been open to having that conversation. It may be, it's also for individuals who live in the nursing home and those are in custodial care. 40 years ago when I started practice and worked in nursing homes, we had one population. Today we have two those in custodial care and those that are receiving post-acute care. It's also for individuals who are receiving long-term care services at home through a home care agency or private services because they have frailty and functional needs. It's also for older adults who may want to receive and avoid certain life-sustaining treatments. And that may come and it may be brought to your attention by the individual who says, it is okay if I die in my sleep. I would, it would be a blessing because I never want to be able to die alone in the hospital on a ventilator and have my family watch me suffer. That's a person who's saying, I really want to have an end of life discussion. It's also for individuals who have multiple advanced chronic conditions or a new diagnosis with a poor prognosis. An 80 year old gentleman who has frailty bad heart disease, lung disease, and now is diagnosed with widely metastatic esophageal cancer. 
And then it, there's the group of individuals who continue to present to the hospital with unplanned admissions. And most of the time, it's coupled with increasing frailty from that previous hospitalization, uh, lack of social support, a decrease in their functional status, um, and progressive weight loss. So those are the kind of factors that as you see the patients you're caring for and their caregivers, that would be triggers for you to think about encouraging them to speak to their physician, nurse practitioner, or PA, whoever they trust to be able to have this discussion. There are screening questions to think about. Does the patient have a healthcare proxy living will, oral advance directive? For some individuals, we need to think about guardianship. Is it of the person? Is, is it of property? Is it of both? We need to have those documents to reveal and identify. And for those who still have capacity, we need a HIPAA release form to know who is it that we can speak to. And the important things, once we know we have these documents, we understand, does the person have the ability to make these decisions? For people with advanced illness and frailty, we have to ask, do they have a MOLST? You know, have you done a MOLST that considers current health status, prognosis, their values, their beliefs, the goals? And if they haven't had one, was it ever offered? And it, two, it also has to address the ability of the person to make end of life decisions. Just a word about thinking about the screening for the two populations in the nursing home. The people that are in skilled nursing getting custodial care are all appropriate. They ought to be screened at admission, get regular follow-up because there's changes in health status. For those, that are in assisted living, the same holds true. For those that are coming in for post-acute care, they are not all appropriate for most, and they need to see whether or not they meet one of those five buckets. It's not for everyone who's in receiving post-acute care. And so this is, is basically the slide that illustrates what I just said in terms of the difference of post-acute and custodial care. It, there are other special needs that we that are beyond the scope of this webinar for individuals that hin, have intellectual and developmental disabilities, special approaches for those that have dementia, particularly where they are over that nine to 10 year course. If they have mental illness, if, there's, if they're a child less than 18, uh, or if they're unbefriended adults and have no one, not even a close friend. Equally important are the special populations in uh, LTAC units, those that are on chronic ventilatory support, be it a ventilator or be it, be it a BiPAP. So let's talk a little bit about MOLST, and, and then we're going to talk about why eMOLST is so important. I know many of you are familiar with this form, but this is more than a form. It is not meant to be a checkbox and just checking off the areas on the form. It is based on a standardized communication process, making sure that the patient and the family understand the current health status, the prognosis, what matters most to the individual. And it's all about shared decision-making with the physician and P or the PA to identify what can and cannot be accomplished for each and every item on the form. There are ethical requirements and the most is not completed until the physician, NP, or PA as of June 17th signs the most. One caveat for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities, only the physician is accountable for and is authorized to sign the most form under 1750B. The discussion that you have that leads to the completion of the form needs to be documented. The result is a set of portable medical orders, and it reflects exactly what the patient wants to receive, what they don't want to receive. It's the only authorized form that EMS can follow both. Do not resuscitate, do not hospitalize, do not intubate in the community. And once the most is done, a palliative care plan needs to be done so that there's a 24 seven plan, particularly for those individuals who need symptom relief and those that do not want to be hospitalized. This is the protocol that was rolled out in 2005 in the first most conference in Rochester um, at which the health department attorneys attended. 
And this was the process. And you'll look and see it's step seven where you complete the moles form. So before you start, you need to be able to prepare. As someone who can help with this process, you can prepare the caregivers. And we'll talk about the tools that are available and the resources. The patient and family need to understand what is happening today. If the patient thinks they have a 10-year prognosis and they may die in the next six months, then they're not ready to proceed with doing the moles form until they understand it can't move forward. You know, once, once it's clear that there's an understanding of what is happening today, then you can proceed to understand goals, hopes, expectations, and then try to make sure that the goals and expectations are realistic. And so you need to use not only the intellect and be honest about what can and can't be accomplished, but empathy, compassion, uh, both sides of your brain. The most will guide the choices that are available, but they need to be done in a way that each and every item, again, uses shared decision making. Once all of that is complete, then you need to complete and sign the moles. Katie will in the demonstration show that there are times where people are not ready to complete everything and how easy it might be, how much easier it is, excuse me, in the email system. Once most is done, it is not like an advanced directive that doesn't need to be updated until there's a change in the healthcare agent or a change in values. These are medical orders and they need to be reviewed and updated periodically at least 90 days, as well as any time there's a care transition, a change in health status, or any time there is a change in what matters most to the individual or the person changes their mind. It's important to understand capacity as part of this process. It's a whole other webinar. It is task specific. Suffice it to say, an individual may still retain the ability to choose their healthcare agent, but may not be able to make most decisions. Capacity is the ability for us to take in information, understand what it means, and then be able to make that informed decision. Even as you think about medical care, there's a difference in our ability to make decisions. A person who can't make most decisions may still be able to ask for simple treatments like treatment for a urinary tract infection, or trouble breathing. A person may also be able to ask for pain relief because it hurts them to raise their shoulder, but not have the ability to make complex end-of-life decisions. We use the clinical frailty scale as part of health status assessment. This is a scale that has been validated and used extensively in Canada. Uh, there's plenty of research that goes beyond it. And it was brought forth as the alternative to the palliative performance scale by individuals in our community at, in upstate New York. It's also important to understand how to estimate and communicate prognosis. No one knows the date and the hour of anyone's death, but it really is about ranges. It may be days to weeks, weeks to three months, less than six months, hospice eligible, less than a year. Um, or more than a year, someone who is not going to die for a few years, but they're 85 in good health, but there are things they want to receive today and don't want to receive today. And they're very explicit about that. So to be able to have this kind of conversation, it's important to develop some effective communication skills. And these are some essential elements that you can think about. First, express yourself clearly. You want to ask open-ended questions. You want to talk less and listen more. You need to listen actively. And you can show people that you're listening actively by reflecting on what they're saying, paraphrasing what you're hearing, and communicating your understanding back to them. Because that will let them know that you're actually listening to what they're saying. And it will help to, help to resolve any conflicts it will help them to come to consensus. That is the family supporting the individual to make their decision. In 1983, an 85-year-old woman taught me a lot, along with my mom, about end-of-life care. And she said to me, everybody gets one chance to live, everyone gets one chance to die. Public health law says that is really the way it should be and affirms the individual's right to make these decisions not the patient's family, not their healthcare agent, unless they 
lost capacity and not their caregivers. They retain the ability to make decisions and if they're deferred to a healthcare agent or surrogate, they have to be based on what that individual wanted. And it's important to understand how to resolve conflicts. And I just wanna mention that in the team-based approach, there's so much that I know there are social workers on this call that can help in terms of family dynamics, as well as helping with conflict resolution, because you've been trained to do that. But it shouldn't be your responsibility and it's outside your scope of practice to sit and complete a most form alone because these are medical orders, it's not an advanced directive. Shared decision-making, I've mentioned several times. These are four questions that I used in my practice, not only for end-of-life care, but to ask questions about, should I do this blood test? Should I do this x-ray? Should I have this chemotherapy? Should I have the surgery? Will the treatment make a difference? What are the burdens and the benefits? How will it help? How will it hurt me? Is there hope of getting better? And it's important to make sure that the physician or NP or PA basically is helping people to understand what will life be like afterwards if they accept the treatment. Because then the fourth and important question is what is important to the person? Dr. Carnivali, I know he's, the, he's one of the doctors on the call today. If he said to me that the best I could do if I accepted a a treatment like intubation and mechanical ventilation uh, to support surgery. And if the best I could do after that surgery was that I would be chronically on a ventilator, not able to know who my family is, need a peg tube and live in a nursing home, unaware of my grandchildren, I would make a different decision than if he said to me, this surgery will get you through it, We'll have you on a ventilator for a short period of time, you'll get off, and you'll be able to enjoy your life as a babshi. That's Polish for grandmother. And so that's how you can tell it's important to not only say, will people recover, but what will life be like afterwards? So identifying values and beliefs are pretty simple. It's really talking to people about what matters most, what makes life worth living, you know, and when you think about goals, we have seen in our geriatric literature that it aligns with three large goals. The first is basically more time for longevity. Someone may say, I want to meet, I want to be able to see my grandson get married. I want to be able to see my granddaughter graduate from medical school and may want to attend my grandson's bar mitzvah. That's about more time. The next might be functional preservation. So many people said to me, please keep me as well as I can be because I never want to go to a nursing home. I want to be able to be functional and be able to live at home and die at home. And finally, people move to the last large goal, which is comfort measures. Please focus on my comfort, my dignity, whatever words they use, and that's the words that you need to use in communication. And so it's important to think about this in light of COVID since that's the current public health emergency that we're dealing with. We ought to use language that aligns with those goals. So if it's the son's wedding, we want to make sure that the treatments that you receive will help you to, re to attend your son's wedding. And we'll do everything we can to maintain your independence. And if it's comfort, we'll do everything to make sure that your, your grandmother's comfort uh, will be our pri priority. This is the list of uh, the Department of Health uh, checklist. There are five for adults, one for pediatric population, and the OPWDD checklist for individuals who lack capacity. This really outlines public health law and what needs to be followed for end-of-life decision-making with or without the most. This basically, the SAF checklist, helps us to know the framework, and all of this is embedded in the email system that Katie will be showing you shortly. Importantly, as you have conversations, it's important to understand and define what CPR is, talk about success rates, understand it. There's a whole web page, I'll show you where it is at the end, that really outlines CPR does not work. And you would be surprised from all of the conversations I've had in the community. There are people thinking that it works in this very frail population. I did a uh, session in the community up in the 
Utica area, and there was a, a gentleman in the, car, uh, in the audience who thought it worked 99% of the time. This gentleman was a retired OBGYN physician. So having information and having initials after your name doesn't mean you understand all of this information. And so you need to be able to communicate that because it doesn't work very well in this very sick population. Similarly, understanding respiratory support and understanding we don't know and have data to say X amount of time will be helpful for someone to be on a ventilator. We need to align it with what matters most to the individual and what are their goals for their care. Similarly, for hospitalization, transfer, and for people who do not want to be transferred, it's why it's essential to have the care plan to support both pain and symptom management as well as to know how you will support the patient, the caregivers, the family, and the staff caring for this individual, and how that can be done uh, during our COVID emergency. I'm going to summarize standard medical care and most, and then hand it over to Katie. So what happens for all of us, if something happens like we have acute chest pain, the ambulance is called. We will get full support, all treatment, unless the physician looks at treatment, unless we have a set of medical orders, and presumably we don't, we get all treatment until the physician assesses and sees what is happening, has a conversation with a, either the healthcare agent or another family member um, who would be a surrogate if, it's, if they don't have a healthcare agent, and basically is going to need to help with that decision making because people will continue to have full treatment until there is a decision to withhold treatment. With MOLS, the flow is basically a person has an acute emergency, EMS is summoned, EMS comes to the home, does an assessment, looks on the refrigerator for the MOLS form. If the patient did not want to leave, they will basically work to enact the palliative care plan they still may want to go to the hospital. If they go to the hospital, 90 plus percent of the time, the patient lacks capacity and the MOLS form will guide the treatment choices. If the person wants more treatment, that's what they'll receive. But they may want palliation that could not be achieved at home. And so they will be admitted for palliation. Importantly, one last comment is end of life conversations pre-COVID were face-to-face, -face. it included family, the medical decision maker, patient, the healthcare agent, or a surrogate. It was a team-based approach within scope of practice based on who has the authority and accountability for medical orders, and it can take more than one conversation. With COVID, there was a rapid shift to telemedicine, and for that reason, it's important to think about um, the, the emos, which is digital transformation uh, to best practice. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Katie. I'm going to need uh, you guys to enable participant screen sharing as hosts. I think Meg is going to do that for you, Katie. Um, Dr. Baum, are you able to make Katie co-host? That would be the fastest way to fix it. While we're getting this figured out, um, for folks that uh, join, may have joined late or haven't already done so, we're taking attendance via the chat. Um, so if you have not already done so, please take a moment now. If you have access to the chat, please put your name and email address into the chat for us. Thank you. Katie, uh, Katie you're close now. 
Thank you. Oops, definitely meant to hit from the current slide. So I'm Katie Orm. I'm the EMOS Administrator for New York State uh, and the Geriatrics and Palliative Care Program Manager at Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield. Thank you for having me. Uh, and I know we've been getting questions in the chat um, that I've been trying to answer live for you folks. Uh, please feel free to continue putting your questions in there. I will do my best to answer them live. Um, and I know Meg um, will be watching the chat as well. So please don't hesitate to interrupt me with your, your, your chat questions. Uh, the email system is both a registry and a form completion tool uh, that captures this process for uh, these very important end of life discussions for this, this narrow population of patients who are appropriate for them. And it works across care settings because everything is accessible at this one website, uh, nysemolstregistry.com. And uh, this allows providers and uh, their team members to retrieve those important medical orders across every care setting uh, where they have access to the internet, which is uh, hopefully all care settings uh, at this point. And it's a free public health service. It's available statewide uh, and again, access it at this URL. For major health systems that have sophisticated EMRs, uh, certainly, they can incorporate EMOLST as part of the single sign-on experience uh, for their providers so that it's really seamless uh, with their EMR. We also have an API um, that they could use to call their, call their data back uh, into the patient's electronic medical record directly. So EMOLST is appropriate for any patient who's appropriate for MOLST, uh, and it can be used for any patient uh, who needs most in New York, including those patients with intellectual or developmental disabilities, uh, because at the end of the day, what's generated is both the most form and a copy of the conversation. Uh, and this can be printed on bright pink paper so that uh, any paper use, for example, EMS has said, we just really like you know, having it on paper right in front of us in the ambulance, for example. Um, that they want that, that kind of access, it can still be printed for all of those types of workflows. And EMOLST really ensures that this process and the documentation to substantiate the decisions is always accessible, not just the orders. And many of you have experienced with paper MOLST, like great, you know, you have your resuscitation orders, your intubation orders, hospitalization, perfect, all right there. But when families challenge the process of that conversation after a patient in particular has lost capacity, it becomes very difficult to understand, well, how did that discussion happen? What was, you know, what was the person's health status? What was their understanding? You know, what was their prognosis when this conversation took place? Um, what, how were the goals for care captured? And sometimes uh, providers do a great job capturing that in their medical record uh, but that's only in their EMR, and no one else can see that, not to mention that it's difficult for even them to retrieve, to go back to the right visit um, to capture the, that goals for care discussion. In EMOLS, that goals for care discussion and all accompanying legal and ethical requirements for this conversation are in one place for the whole state. And so the hospitalist who sees that patient can go back and see, what did the PCP put in the system? You know, what did the um, RN care manager who kicked off this conversation, um, you know, document about goals for care initially before uh, the patient met with their physician and peer PA to confirm the conversation and have the order signed. So EMOLS ensures quality, patient safety, that this process is done in a patient-centered way and that it's not done in a way, um, you know, like Dr. Rama said, you don't want to hear, uh, if your heart stops, you want us to start it. Um, you know, that's not productive. Um, it's much more productive to have these conversations be patient-centered, focused on goals first, and then hear recommendations from the medical team about what are the interventions that would match up with this person's goals, you know, so that shared decision-making can occur. EMOLS also prevents incompatible medical orders and like CPR with DNI. And some patients and families don't even realize that those don't go together. And occasionally providers who are rushed, they're busy, they make mistakes on paper moles, 
and they put in those exact type of orders uh, that you know really set that family up for for problems and for conflict uh, because that's saying you know please do everything to keep me alive but not that you know and that's not or even bring me back from the dead you know but don't you know help me breathe and that's an inconsistency that emuls would prevent there are also a variety of other incompatible orders that emuls would prevent but that's the, the biggest one that we see in paper And why use emuls? Uh, so we've had some uh, great uh, snippets captured from physicians, attorneys, and we've captured them on our YouTube um, website, our YouTube channel, and that they convey the accuracy, the quality, patient safety, um, the risk management benefits, not to mention most importantly to most health systems is the accessibility. And that's what's most important to patients too. We hear from patients pretty routinely at this point, um, especially with COVID, saying, I wanna make sure my MOLST is available in eMOLST. I want my doc to do it in eMOLST. Um, and it's very important to understand that physicians, NPs, PAs who do these discussions, who complete these orders, are the ones accountable for doing them in eMOLST. Patients are not responsible for having their forms loaded or scanned documents loaded to the eMOLST system. And EMOLST also aligns with a lot of the value-based payment models uh, that health systems are working on with their um, payer partners uh, as it's really focused on quality, patient preferences, uh, and ensuring that people are getting what they want at the end of life, that these conversations are had in a, in a high quality manner. There's also the opportunity to reduce unwanted hospitalizations. I know personally, my grandmother, you know, if she never saw the inside of Rochester General again, um, you know, after age 89 or 90 or so, um, she would have been very happy. And to RGH's credit, she did have a fall um, where she was sent to their ED, emergency department with a most. Uh, and RGH looked at that and said, hey, this lady doesn't want to be here. Um, you know, what can we do to treat her pain and get her out? Because she has a do not hospitalize on this most. Um, she came here because she was in extreme pain. And we have a case example from Central New York um, that highlights really the value, particularly of these conversations happening upstream in primary care settings in particular. Uh, and then how when the patient ends up hospitalized, so you see Dr. Torres here in this photo, he is a, um, a hot, or he was at the time, a hospital physician um, in the North Country. Uh, he checked emails when he had a patient enter his emergency department. Um, who of all the patients, you know, this guy only had one lung due to lung cancer, um, that this guy needed an EMOLS. He had, you know, advanced um, lung disease and other uh, chronic conditions. And Dr. Torres was like, wow, if anybody needs, needs an EMOLS, it's this guy. But his wife, who was, you know, almost incoherent with uh, distress, wasn't able to produce the document in the emergency. Uh, even though it was printed, it was accidentally left on the fridge at home in this emer in emergency situation. And Dr. Torres simply looked up the patient in emails and said, okay, we don't have to intubate him. He didn't want that. He doesn't want to be sent, you know, 100 miles south to Syracuse. Um, let's treat him conservatively in line with his preferences, in line with the emails orders. Uh, and uh, this gentleman ended up surviving um, and died two months later on hospice at home the way that he wanted. And his wife uh, provided a great quote uh, when Dr. Bauman and I did a site visit up there, you know, just like, thank God for emails, because in that uh, crisis, she wasn't able to articulate that her husband and his PCP had had these conversations, that they'd made decisions. Um, and it was the email system that ensured accessibility to those uh, patient preferences across that care transition. So I'm going to show you guys the email system now. So I'm logging in with username and password. And uh, that is one way, it's actually the most common way that folks um, in nursing homes in particular log in across our state. Um, they tend to have um, some less sophisticated EMR implementation. Uh, we also see PCPs and independent practices logging in this way. Uh, but folks who are working with sophisticated EMRs can certainly enable single sign-on with us, and there's no cost 
you know, there's no charge from us to do that. Um, that's just configurable uh, from the electronic medical record that we can help with. Um, the next step is to search. I'm going to search all of New York State here. I'm not just searching Rochester or Munner County or the Finger Lakes. I'm searching all of New York. And we're looking by first name, last name, date of birth and gender. I'm looking for Jenny Lake here and there are no exact matches anywhere in New York, no possible matches. And I can show you what this would look like potentially if we had searched for a really common name in our test system. Obviously there's no PHI in here. So Mickey Mouse, so there's a bunch of Mickey Mouses and then it gives us additional details like this guy's from Rochester, this one's from Chenango, that one's from Orlando. You know, and then possible matches where did I, you know, mess up typing this guy's date of birth, it would make him, you know, 119 years old. Um, you know, was it supposed to be even 1910 instead of 1901? Um, so Emos is suggesting possible matches for us where the names are the same, but the um, date of birth might be a bit different. <laughs> I'm going to go back to Jenny Lake. I don't need one more Mickey Mouse and Emils, and I'm going to create her profile. We're going to fill out some basic demographic questions um, to help distinguish this Jenny uh, from any other Jenny Lake with the same date of birth who might also be in the system. Uh, and that's a very infrequent occurrence, but in a state the size of New York, it's possible. Um, and obviously this kind of data, um, you know, the address data in particular are captured. Uh, on the paper most form and uh, are really valuable when EMS is confirming in an emergency who this person is in front of them who's you know collapsed or arrested in particular. And this emails can be used in a lot of different care settings, any different care setting um, where these conversations are taking place, including the patient's home and hospice. Um, for just you know expediency today, we'll do this at Hogwarts Hospital. You can see that providers would have access to emails from all the many different settings where they might work. And I'm going to start a new emails form. We're going to keep this case pretty simple. We'll model Jenny here off of my own grandmother. If we were converting from paper most or non-hospital DNR, um, some of you had questions about the non-hospital DNR in the chat. Um, certainly the DNR is great for only resuscitation. You know, it's not sufficient. Uh, because pa patients who have resuscitation preferences often have intubation preferences, they have respiratory support preferences. Uh, and so we could be converting grandma's old non-hospital DNR into EMOLST, for example. And she might have consented to that actually quite, quite a while ago uh, before she was entered in the EMOLST system. And if we were converting from paper MOLST, we could convert um, also page two, those other life-sustaining treatment decisions into emails as well using the original date of consent here. Uh, these dates are really important to when did the patient make this decision, especially because today they might have lost capacity. Now that we're going to a digital form, uh, it doesn't mean that the patient loses their rights to those decisions that they made several years ago, uh, perhaps even when they were healthier. Um, so my grandmother, she actually died this year, but you know she was 92 um, or nearly 92 when she passed away. And the, you know, her resuscitation decision had been made when she was like 83 or 84. She knew she lived a good life and, you know, if the Lord took her, it was her time. And that's pretty much exactly what she told us um, almost a decade before she died. So we answer some basic patient status questions. And she didn't come from a mental health facility or correctional facility. She didn't have developmental disabilities without capacity. Uh, but any one of these could trigger either a different pathway or different questions on the same pathway for us. And then our health status questions. Uh, so this is how sick is she? And I can say that when she was um, updating her most uh, recently before her death um, in summer 2019, she was not at high risk of dying. Um, in the next six months, she wasn't eligible for hospice yet. Um, but that's when she made sure that she, she had that do not hospitalize on her, her most orders. And her physician said her prognosis was six months to less than a year. He wouldn't be surprised if she died in the next year. 
he also wouldn't have been surprised if she lived another few years. She was a tough cookie. But she had severe um, heart disease that was very advanced. And she'd done her healthcare proxy, of course. If she hadn't done it, though, he almost would have prompted the provider to get a healthcare proxy from this woman while she could still complete one. And she had the ability to make her own decisions. She was the decision maker. You can see if she lacked capacity, Emos would prompt us then to use the healthcare agent pathway. Um, and then, of course, um, if she didn't have a healthcare proxy, move down the public health law surrogate pathway. Values, beliefs, and goals, what matters to her, she said, uh, it's not for providers to go through this list and say, uh, do you want to participate in meaningful relationships? Do you want to not be a burden on your loved, you know, that's not the purpose of this section. Uh, it's that these are things that patients often volunteer when asked, what makes life worth living? What is really important to you? What are you hoping to accomplish? Um, what do you want your end of life experience to be like? Um, and she would have said she doesn't want to be a burden on her family. She'd want to maintain quality of life and maintain who she is as much as possible, as long as possible. Live independently with grandpa uh, here in East Rochester. She'd want to focus on functionality. And she enjoyed attending um, family events, especially the weddings of her grandchildren. And at one point she was really enjoying still traveling to Florida, but she had stopped that um, because it just became too much um, of a burden for her. So we're saying this email was being completed in the hospital, but obviously we really encourage completion upstream um, in primary care settings. Um, or specialty practices where the patients have a relationship with the physician and peer PA who is doing this conversation with them um, and with the care team who might be participating in this conversation with them. This hospice question is not legally relevant in hospital settings, so that's why it's grayed out. But if she'd been in a community setting, um, it would be, uh, we'd have to answer that question. It could change the legal pathway we're on. So email selected checklist one for us. And we capture resuscitation instructions. I'm gonna demo, it's not gonna let us do incompatible orders. Grandma, you know, didn't ask for this anyways, but um, we can't do CPR with DNI. It's not gonna let us make that mistake. DNR had been in line with her preferences for almost a decade. Limited interventions, she would have still accepted potentially a trial period of, at one point, um, in all the revisions to her most over the years. Um, of non-invasive ventilation, you know, early on in her mid-80s, she would have accepted intubation and mechanical ventilation. But it, eventually she said, no, don't intubate me. Don't bring me back to the hospital. And her physician actually deferred these decisions. And that's all demo what that looks like. Um, you know, he felt like she wasn't at high risk of needing a feeding tube. Um, and so he didn't even offer that part of the conversation to her at first. Um, and in emails, we have decision deferred. Um, it's important that blanks are not left on, on most forms and on paper most, unfortunately, that's a common problem where providers say, oh, we can talk about that later, uh, but that leaves you know, the field open to anybody checking anything off, frankly, uh, and their signature goes on it. They would never leave, leave a blank pres signed prescription out, and that's what that's like. They're supposed to be putting X's through each section they skip and mark decision deferred. So I'm just gonna check this here so you guys see what that looks like. She was still willing to use antibiotics. Save and continue. And that trials box at the end or the other instructions box, as you guys know it, um, is where people document dialysis, transfusion, other specific um, preferences that are applicable to the person based on maybe trial intubation, trial BiPAP, trial feeding tube even, that had been selected earlier. When it comes to witnessing, witnesses are 18 years or older. Uh, totally awesome to have a family witness. Maybe Sarah, her daughter, was there with her. And then the physician, NPRPA, who's leading this discussion, can also always be one of the witnesses. So witnessing is not should not be burdensome. These witnesses um, could be, especially you know, in today's day and age, uh, via telemedicine. Right, this conversation could have taken place via telemedicine. And we're seeing a huge. We saw a huge increase in telemedicine use um, during COVID, no surprise, um, but with EMOLS in particular because of the importance of 
not being face to face with people, but also ensuring their end of life preferences were captured efficiently. Uh, we've had thousands um, of providers enrolling in our system in the last several months. So patient has to give informed consent. And basically section five is where we're capturing anything that wasn't captured from a legal or ethical perspective elsewhere in the document so far. Um, and then in a hospital or nursing home, you need those two witnesses, at least 18 years of age or older, one of whom had to be that health or social service practitioner. So that's your physician, your NP, your PA, your RN, or your licensed clinical social worker, or a psychologist. Um, and, and this really helps clarify, you know, uh, from the law directly, who needs to be engaged in these discussions? Obviously, we always know that that provider, the physician and peer PA, needs to confirm the conversation and sign the orders, but it, you know, it becomes incredibly clear that they also have to be one of the witnesses to this discussion. It couldn't just be had um, by a social worker outside scope of practice and then signed by the provider. They had to actually be a witness to this. And then time spent. How long did this take? Um, and these boxes are optional. We see them most commonly used in primary care settings. Hospitals typically have their own way of capturing time spent. So sections one through five are accessible to team members who are part of this conversation. You know, you might have a physician and social worker working hand in hand, uh, where social workers documenting and emails, you know, um, helping to lead part of the goals for care discussion, navigate some of those difficult family dynamics. Uh, and the physician is explaining the person's health status, their prognosis, right? Talking through the different medical interventions. Uh, so social worker can be documenting as they go and capturing all this, um, for example, and the physician can then log in uh, and confirm and sign everything. So this section on signature is only available to our licensed physicians, NPs, and PAs uh, in line with the law. Uh, and of course, their scope of practice there is one exception to that for patients with in intellectual or developmental disabilities, only a licensed physician um, can sign those orders. And EMOS would stop a nurse practitioner or a PA from incorrectly signing those forms. So they choose their secret question, answer, um, and their secret image. And they can figure that once when they log in um, the first time to EMOS. And then they choose the location where they're signing from. So you can see I have privileges at lots of places in here, but I'm signing today from Hogwarts Hospital. I'm gonna click view and print. Okay, here's what I found. Siri's excited to be part of this with us. I thought I was on mute, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> You're just really quiet, Dr. All right, so now we've got a, a most that is signed by our uh, physician here, who uh, obviously I'm logged in as a physician today, or our NP or PA. Uh, and all the witnesses are legible, everything is dated and timed. Uh, and you can see what decision deferred looks like, as well as that original resuscitation consent date from several years ago. Um, you know, and this is really important, you know, if, and this fortunately did not happen in my family, but if someone had challenged grandma's wishes when she did lose capacity at the end of life uh, and said, now that I'm in charge, I'm the healthcare proxy, resuscitate her. We have captured that this was a long-standing resuscitation preference, right? Going back many years um, that, you know, she knew she'd lived a good life and had made that decision a long time ago. And she was great. She actually communicated that to all of us. But in some families, there isn't that good communication uh, and the physician and other providers' responsibility is always to honoring the patient's preferences, you know, not to, uh, you know, listening to family members who incorrectly believe that they're in charge now that their loved one lost capacity. The review and renew section of EMOLST is populated um, with the most recent review at the top. So those of you who have worked in nursing homes, you'll know you're like flipping all the pages of review and renew to see when the most recent one occurred. First of all, in EMOLST, it's, it's gonna remind you to review and renew according to your policy and procedure, which is customizable in the EMOLST system. But second, you're never gonna be flipping pages again because the most recent will go to the top instead of the bottom for you. Uh, so it, it's very easy to always find it on page three. And this is much more valuable for our providers on the hospital side too, uh, because they get to see, okay, yeah, this was done and redone and edited, you know, all those different times. Um, and we're really confident 
that this most is representing current values, current beliefs, current goals, current preferences uh, based on current health status and prognosis, which is what the whole process is about. You know, when you encounter a most that is, hasn't been reviewed for a year, um, it still must be honored in the emergency, but you start to wonder, is this still current health status and prognosis? Does this still reflect current goals? Because especially for these people who are seriously ill, things can change quickly at the end. So this page doesn't apply. It's only for people with intellectual developmental disabilities. These, ins these instructions are only for those patients. Um, and so EMOS just watermarks that it doesn't apply, so you don't have to worry about it. And then EMOS generates all of the documentation to align with the health department's checklist number one. Uh, you know, and you can see across all these care settings now, where was she at on this clinical frailty scale when these decisions were made? Okay, she was already severely frail. Right, her physician had said she had probably six months to a year. He wouldn't be surprised. Uh, she did a healthcare proxy, right? It's very transparent to every other care setting where she's seen exactly how this conversation took place and the high quality way um, that it was done. So that if we did have those family members come in to challenge things, um, it would be much easier to say, okay, you know, um, this is why she made these decisions. Um, and, you know, now that she's so much worse, what are the additional things uh, she would want us to know about her instead of starting from scratch, which is the position that unfortunately um, some in institutions are in, you know, particularly hospitals, when patients uh, lack capacity and they have family members who try to challenge the most orders. So we see her goals for care discussion here and our providers tend to use this box as a diary. So for my grandmother, you know, I demonstrated one of her molsts basically today, but she had had a molst for eight years, maybe, maybe a little bit longer even when she died uh, because she lived into her 90s. Uh, and she'd originally done it in her 80s when her heart disease had worsened considerably, she needed surgery. Um, and after that surgery, she knew that her preferences had changed. Um, and so, you know, they use it as a diary to say, okay, this is what the goals were then. Okay, we, you know, we talked about it, you know, a few months later and goals had changed. We talked about it, you know, six months after that, goals changed again. Uh, you know, so some of like when she didn't want to go back to Florida anymore, that's like the perfect example of goals kind of shifting there. Even if the orders didn't change dramatically, understanding um, the person's preferences uh, across that timeline is really valuable for these discussions and gives so much insight to other care settings where they wouldn't have known my grandmother. And then of course the legal requirements, informed consent, witnessing, and then um, the physician time spent and signature. And again, that time spent is optional. A lot of docs have another tool for documenting time spent already. They don't have to use emails for that if they don't want to, but certainly it's a backup for audit purposes if they choose to. Do folks have questions? We could save this as a draft. You know, we didn't have to get it all done in one session. You know, I'm demonstrating this today. Um, but, you know, especially in primary care, you might see people make a resuscitation decision um, like my grandmother did and then come back to it, you know, even six months later and say, okay, I thought about what it was like, you know, when I was intubated or I experienced intubation. Um, and maybe I would accept a trial of that again or maybe I wouldn't. Um, and so that can get captured um, iteratively. Uh, certainly, you know, if people aren't ready to make choices, but they understand, they know some of their goals, you can just, you know, save and exit at that goals for care box uh, and leave the decisions for later uh, for, for when it's, for when they're ready to move on with that discussion. So Katie, there, there was a question uh, about whether we have a, whether we have a list of facilities uh, where EMOS is being used. And I said that we continue to have that changed. So we don't have it posted anywhere because it's hard to keep up with it. But the question was more broad. Uh, it was a private one to me to know what can, what can people do to basically help move this forward. And so one of our participants, um, mom uh, lives at home and a, a paper mulch was done recently and would like to get um, get her mom into the EMOS registry and make sure it was done correctly. What would you suggest? So for pe people like that, and you know, I got a phone call from a patient over Labor Day weekend who was saying the same exact thing. You know, I did a paper mulch with my doctor and 
I want it, I want it to be an email so it's accessible um, to, in this case, it was Rochester General's ED. Um, and I said, I am happy to help your physician with that uh, because unfortunately patients can't load their own medical orders, just like patients can't, you know, send scans of their prescriptions to the pharmacy. Um, and expect them to be filled, right? Physicians electronically order or, or other providers electronically order those things. And that's the same in EMOLS. So we'd ask for your physician, MP or PA, um, or the, their office staff, right? They can kick off the enrollment process um, to get access to the EMOLS system. Uh, we have a lot of health systems that participate with EMOLS. There are more than 50,000 living New Yorkers with EMOLS forms today in the system. Um, so there's plenty of data to be retrieved if you're a health system on the line listening and thinking, you know, what's the value to us implementing? Certainly, it, you know, you can retrieve orders for over 50,000 people. Um, but, the, you know, from a patient and family perspective, asking your health systems to use EMOLST, asking your physicians to use EMOLST um, has been very effective uh, in other parts of our state. And the only other thing that I would add is that uh, it's important for, for the providers when you talk to them to let them know that it's a public health service and access is free because that may be one of the questions that they would have. Um, and in the presentations and in, our, in the chat, our emails are there. It's all over the web. And so it's like 1-800-CALL-THE-EMOST administrator. Um, and, and I would... Uh, concur with Katie. Uh, she and Meg do a wonderful job working with, particularly upstream, trying to get, we work with everyone, but we really want to exactly um, getting it to the individual patients. And because of your advocacy for caregivers, you can really help us. And so there's a question about whether there is a, a, an eMOST app to access an update, which is very oh. easy and to answer, Katie, why don't you answer that? Yeah, so the EMOLST tool allows for very easy um, updating of the orders. So you just start with the most recent order selected for this patient. And then you can update what's needed. So at some point, my grandmother did become very severely frail. And while she retained capacity to make decisions, she moved to comfort. She told me at the end of last summer, I don't have any more goals, Katie, because, you know, of course, we have this conversation over and over. Um, and she said, I have no more goals. So there's one other uh, question, um, and I think you answered it, but it would be good to reaffirm it. If yep. someone has a previous paper moles, can a patient set up their own e -moles? Unfortunately, the patient can't. Because the orders are being reaffirmed electronically, they need to be done by a physician, NP or PA. Obviously, their office staff, um, or if they're in a facility setting, you know, the, the nurses and social workers can assist with that conversion. But the, uh, only the physician, NP or PA, can reauthorize those orders in EMOLS. Just like only a physician, NP or PA, could sign that review and renew box um, on, pages, on page three of the paper MOLS. You're reauthorizing orders. So it has to be done by the physician and peer PA. And the only thing I would add is that's the reason I started really talking about advanced directives and medical orders and trying to separate what they are. And just to think about it, advanced directives is something we do as individuals. We do have the ability to, um, to do the advanced, you know, the healthcare proxy, have it witness, sign it, but only the physician would create medical orders and think about it if a person is being admitted to the nursing home does the patient write their own medical orders for admission no same holds true for the hospital so you got to think about this in terms of these are medical orders and most importantly they're end of life orders they're life and death decisions and they really while a team-based approach can be used as we illustrated it has to be done within scope of practice and not only to sign a most but the authority and the accountability currently is with a physician, an NP, or a PA just as recently as June 17th of this year. And until two years ago, it was only the physician. And as we've said it, I said it, Katie said it, for those with IDD who lack capacity to make decisions, it's only the physician. And one other thing in terms of witnessing, I wanna you know, 
uh, reiterate what Katie already said, in, in most it, and emos, it is the witness to the conversation. In advanced directives in healthcare proxy, you're witnessing the signature. And for those with IDD, there are special requirements and we can um, review those at another uh, webinar that's focused on just that population. And while you were explaining that, Dr. Rama, I made a small change to this emos um, that indicated comfort measures only now. Use hospice, don't go, you know, um, don't use feeding tube or IV fluids, uh, only use antibiotics for comfort, uh, and updated it, new date and time, right? New witnesses. And you can see where the reviewer new is right here. We also had a question in the chat for what does MPH mean? Uh, that's my master's in public health. So I work on end of life care uh, and palliative care from a population health perspective. Uh, so it's my master's in public health. And I'm not sure what the other one, which is MPRA. I think that was a mistype. Okay. So Katie, I don't know if you can stay on or if you have to get to that other um, webinar. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm, I'm texting them right now. Um, if, are there additional, I'm happy to stay on if there are additional questions. And then my uh, email um, is readily available in the PowerPoint. Um, and I just ask that you keep Dr. Rama and Meg CC'd in on uh, anything that you send me so we can all stay on the same page for you guys. Thanks very much. There's a lot more to the EMOLS tool. If you work for an organization that's interested in using EMOLS, uh, please reach out. Uh, and there's a lot more features that we're, we'd be able to show you guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Katie. Um, I'm just going to go through a few uh, resources to make sure that you all know where to get the information we've talked and, and referred to them but I want you to be aware of some of the communication skills in patient and family education. Katie uh, mentioned that we have a compassion and support YouTube channel. We have multiple playlists on advanced care planning, on advanced directives, uh, what a healthcare proxy is. They're very short and sweet. Um, I demonstrated two of the public service announcements. There are six of them. They're all 32nd. Uh, public service announcements. They were done professionally. We also have produced ourselves uh, videos with real physicians and nurses uh, demonstrating thoughtful most discussions. In one, in the hospital and hospice setting, uh, Katie plays a, a, an emotional daughter. Sarah Butterfield from IPRO is a thoughtful daughter. There's no healthcare proxy and a palliative care physician you know, walks through that eight-step protocol and each and every item on the form. We have them, if you walk through that, how to demonstrate, how to have that kind of conversation. We've also broken it up into individual steps and the individual items on the, on the uh, MOLS form. We similarly have one in the nursing home. Um, we also have, and for many of you, you know, we had an, uh, a pro professionally produced uh, most video for patient and uh, family and caregiver education called writing your final chapter we updated in 2015 to comply with uh, family health care decisions act it does not include nurse practitioners and pas um, um, we haven't been able to do that given uh, current situation with covid but it's an excellent film for people to understand uh, the value of, of most because uh, there are two patient stories before MOLS, there are three um, after MOLS was created that really show why living wills are not uh, enough. Because, and I didn't mention it before, but one of the reasons that living wills, uh, one, one of the reasons MOLS was created was because consumers told us um, 20 years ago that it was, that doctors weren't following their wishes expressed in a living will. And frankly, that's because oftentimes 
medicine is so complex, the medical conditions can coexist with a terminal illness and a potentially reversible. Uh, for example, someone with end-stage dementia can aspirate and have an aspiration pneumonia. And many times these folks were coming into the emergency room, uh, were found to have pneumonia, were treated conservatively, they didn't get better. Um, they were put on a ventilator um, and that was viewed as against um, the person's preferences, but that was to treat the potentially reversible pneumonia. MOLST allows us to have the medical orders to be done upstream to prevent some of those hospitalizations that are unwanted. We also have a whole host of different uh, references, and there's a whole page on references on both compassionandsupport.org and MOLST.org. So I just want to talk a little bit about compassionandsupport.org. <clears throat> That's the website that was um, uh, put together 20 years ago uh, in response to consumers' desire to have education. In 2007, we were able to revise and update it. And in 2018, we redesigned it because it was crumbling again. And we decided to create two uh, population health integrated sister sites. CompassionSupport.org is redesigned. This is one of the hero images, and MOLST.org is the second. This is for people who are seriously ill. They're interdigitated because on CompassionAndSupport.org, we still have advanced care planning, palliative care hospice, death and dying. On, on MOLST.org, we have how to create it, all of the laws. Uh, we have information on uh, education. Um, we have, in the midst of COVID, updated um, and has COVID-specific guidance. Uh, all of the web pages on life-sustaining treatment orders were updated with up-to-date references. Uh, we also have a specific page on dialysis, which would be um, very important because of the increasing number of older adults uh, with renal insufficiency um, who have not been given the opportunity to have conservative treatment and have a real shared uh, decision-making discussion about it. Uh, there's a toolkit from CAPSI that has a lot of protocols for symptom management. And uh, Meg is on the phone today and his work is coordinating ECHO MOLST and EMOLST. It starts tomorrow. It's a one-hour uh, clinic. <clears throat> there are nine weekly sessions. And if you're interested in registering, her email address is here. And I would encourage you to think about it. This is our platform for sustainable education. We, and it's different than a, a webinar because the clinics are based on the ECHO model where we start with a very short didactic presentation. Then we have a real case presentation and then facilitated discussion. And it echoes to me um, the kind of bedside learning that I learned with because, and we, we've had feedback that it has changed uh, practices and it's the cases and the facilitated discussion because many people struggle with these difficult conversations and people can share um, how they've approached it. Uh, there's separate areas on MOLST.org on the legal requirements. And as I said, there's a whole set of pages that are brand new that were developed in the spring to deal with COVID-19 and a page in terms of how to get urgent access to emails because we were getting requests um, across the state, but particularly in the, in the uh, crisis area in New York City, where the value of emails was shown to be incredibly positive. As you'll recall, so many people came in from out of state to help and they were able to smoothly use the email system to do the orders correctly. Many of you I know have been helping through the crisis and in my mind you're a hero and I thank you and it reminds me of Christopher Reeve's words, a hero is an individual who finds strength to persevere in spite of overwhelming obstacles. Um, and as we prepare um, for future emergencies, I wanna thank you for all of your assistance in helping us to spread and accelerate the digital transformation to emails. I'm gonna see if there are any other questions, but to start us off, I just wanna make sure that everyone uh, in the chat actually saw the, uh, the question that was there in terms of 
uh, non-hospital DNRs versus um, the MOLS form. And just to kind of put that clearly, the non-hospital DNR form is still um, a valid form, but it does not provide us with, uh, does not provide patients with all of the options to be able to make decisions. And keep in mind, a DNR only applies when the person has a cardiac and or pulmonary arrest and they're dead. And so it's basically a plan for the last 15 minutes of life. And you cannot, on a non-hospital DNR, write DNI, and EMS cannot follow it. They can only follow DNR, DNI, do not hospitalize, and the other orders on a MOLS. It was tested for three years in both Monroe and Onondaga counties. I think the other piece is as we're moving into this brave new world, we know that the palliative care plan is important and, and we need it 24 seven because people don't wanna leave home. They haven't wanted to leave home. And so we know telemedicine is being used more frequently. Uh, paramedicine where EMS goes in not to transport to ED, but to stay um, and treat the person in place. Uh, there are wraparound programs that insurance companies have. So there's a lot to making sure that palliative care plan is in place. I am gonna see if there are any other questions. For some reason, I'm not seeing the chat. So let me come out of this for just a minute and see if I can find the chat. Cancel. <clears throat> Looks like you answered all the ones from the chat, Dr. Hamba. Okay. Is there anyone else that has any questions before I kind of um, move to the close with the story? Any other questions, Meg? Nope. Okay. I just wanted to close with this personal story. Um, Doris started with a personal story. And this is my mother um, and my daughter, Stephanie. Um, and this was my, our daughter's medical school graduation in May of 2007. And my mom um, came to live with us because she was having some difficulty um, with her thinking, uh, was getting forgetful. And I had really been supporting my sister as a long, uh, as a caregiver long distance and I told my mom it would be easier for her to be with us um, because when she was repetitive, that was not something my sister was handling well. So when she came to see us, to the point that Katie made about having people do it upstream, she needed a new physician. She came from Pennsylvania and she went to see um, a new physician who did her physical, and you know, started talking and asked if she wanted to talk about MOLST. But the story really didn't start in 2007. I should really go back to the story in the early 90s, in 1992, because it made the MOLST discussion far easier and much more fruitful when she met with the physician. In 1992, my mom taught me a lot about advanced care planning because she wanted to complete her own advanced directives and asked if I would be her agent, and if I would come if she needed me, um, if I would do what she wanted, not what I thought was best, and, um, and I agreed to all of that. And so we filled out our paperwork, and she wisely said to me, uh, as she chose the healthcare agents, um, the oldest of five girls, there are two that can do this and be a backup to you, but for two of them, it will be very hard and I can't put them on the piece of paper. I can't put them because I love them. She said, and we can't just do this as a piece of paper. We need a family meeting. So in 1992, we had our first uh, healthcare proxy party at Thanksgiving um, because that's when our family gathered as our home to start the holidays. And my mom started it not by talking about interventions. She started talking about what mattered most. And she started talking about life was worth living because she was a babshi, which is Polish for grandmother. And she wanted to be able to travel and be engaged with her grandchildren as long as she could. She understood she was becoming forgetful, but she wanted to preserve her personhood. And, and then she said, I want, to, um, I want to be able to 
make sure that things are done in accordance to what I want. And so she explained that she chose me, explained that I wasn't going to make decisions as a physician, but do things that she would want based on what mattered most to her. Um, and then she said there were two backups and she looked at my two sisters that she chose and said, I want you to be backups. And she looked at the other two and said, I didn't choose you because I love you. It's a big responsibility. Um, and it's not like Pat's going to make decisions and not talk to the rest of the family because this is a family event. Living is a family event. Dying is a family event. And we did that conversation uh, every Thanksgiving. So fast forward to when she came and met a new doctor in Rochester in 2007, she was prepared to have a conversation. And so she said, I'm ready to talk about this. And her first was very similar to Katie's grandmother. He's like, if the good Lord says it's my time, it's okay. I've lived a good life. Um, I don't want to have any attempt at resuscitation. It doesn't mean I don't want treatment, which is something that people often confuse. They think do not resuscitate means do not treat. It doesn't, it means only if you die, do not make an attempt to resuscitate. And so for the, the next form, she said, I would go to the hospital. If I had pneumonia, I would take antibiotics. I would take IV fluids, but you know what? If, if I'm not getting better, I wouldn't want machines. She was very strict Catholic um, and said, I want ordinary measures. I don't want extraordinary measures. So her most was completed and she had her regular checkups for her medical problems aside from her forgetfulness every three months and her most form was updated because goals had not changed. And she was getting excited to go to my niece's wedding in September of 2007. And when she went, um, her physician, who was my former partner, and I put together a most life pack that included information we always gave our patients to have on their refrigerator, their healthcare proxy, a copy of any other advanced directives, um, a list of their problems, their medical problems, their medications, their allergies, um, their non-hospital DNR form in my mother's case, in addition to a MOLS, because she was traveling to another state where they didn't have a set of medical orders like most, and a list of contacts, who to call if there's an emergency, and education to the family that they needed to, to take that information. It was like a mini medical record, and it needed to go from person to person. And unfortunately, my mother got sick uh, that September and ended up um, in a hospital emergency room when I was lecturing on elder abuse out in Arizona. Um, but she, that information was there and the physicians followed that information and contacted me. I flew home and unfortunately at the time my mother had a kidney infection which turned out to be uh, related to some blockage on her um, ureter related to some cancer in her abdomen. Uh, she had advanced cancer that turned out to be a kind of cancer that her sister had. And in terms of, you know, talking about it, she um, essentially said to the doctors, I want to be sure that I get to my granddaughter's wedding because um, she had two weeks of antibiotics and two weeks of rehab and post-acute care. And the wedding was in the midst of the hospitalization. To the credit of the doctors, we were able to get her to the wedding. Uh, she chose not to have any chemotherapy, um, but when she returned to Rochester, she wasn't the same person after two weeks in a hospital, two weeks in a post-acute rehab unit, um, and she came back to have the conversation with the physician who reviewed all the information, and she, she uh, updated her MOLS form again to, based on goals of wanting to die in our home with comfort, with no chemo, and she again chose to continue to not resuscitate, do not hospitalize, however, do not intubate, no IV fluids, and she chose hospice. And she was able to have four good months uh, in our home before she passed away. Um, I, I believe in this, in this program, both professionally and personally, and I thank all of you for all of what you do uh, to share um, the importance and the value of most and emols. And with that, I'm going to close. And I'm sorry I went over two minutes, Doris. Uh, 
Uh, there was one question, uh, Dr. Bamba, and it was, uh, do other states have a program comparable to mold? In terms of other states, you're talking about other states. So that, that is a growing, um, actually there's growth in terms of other states uh, since we started the MOLS program uh, 20 years ago. New York was one of the founding uh, states. I was one of the founding members and virtually every state has some type of program. Um, I think that I would, I would need to compliment our providers who have used the MOLS program and have provided uh, feedback regularly because we have a more sophisticated MOLS form than any other state in the country. And we have the only state that has this kind of email system. And when I say more sophisticated, it's a, it's a form that meets the patient's needs today because medicine is so complicated. Yep. Um, this person was asking about a specific state in particular. Um, if you go, actually, I'll put it in the chat here. There's a national pulse. It's called Pulse Nationally. Um, I'll put nationalpulse.org, their website, in the chat you can go there and there's actually a map and you can click on the specific state that you're looking for information on to get contact info about that state's program. I see there's one other question which is where to keep the most and where do EMS look for it and uh, EMS looks for the most in the same place that they looked for non-hospital DNR forms since 1992 and that is on the refrigerator. They will also look, oftentimes, if it's not there, they'll look at the bedside if someone is at home and basically uh, bedroom. Um, if you travel from the home and, and let's presume it's past COVID and someone is still able to go out shopping, uh, like my mother did, go to restaurants, I always carry the most from with her. And so as emos becomes more, um, widely used and is the only form and the only way that people get it. We will have other ways of getting access and EMS will be able to have it. But for right now, it's important to have the form. Put it on the refrigerator and if you're using emuls, it should be printed in pink paper. And that comes from EMS across the state. They say, don't take our pink away. So when you use emuls, we, we, can, we always teach people print it on pink paper. Um, because EMS found that the white DNR could never be found. I think that's it. And I, I see someone said, hope to see you again. Katie and I would be delighted to come back. And uh, Meg, Meg is available if anyone is interested in Echo Most, and they can uh, reach out to her. So thanks so much for having us, Doris. I'll turn it back. You are so welcome. You're so welcome, Pat, and thank you and your